Okay, this lesson for the Cornet Project class concerns a dispute about certainty. Uh, there are religionists on one hand who say you can have assurance but not certainty. And an article written by Dr. Bob Wilkin 25 years ago, 1997, I happened to notice it, read it, look at it, and was quite impressed with his assertion that assurance is certainty. And as we proceed, uh, I'd like to make reference to that article in which one of the people that took issue with Dr. Wilkin, he said there's uh, types of certainty, mathematical certainty, legal certainty, uh, moral certainty. Um, so we'll look at that, but we'll first think of what do we do first in this class uh, because of our holistic, historical holistic hermeneutics. We want to define our term so let's define our term in 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, no, no, 1, 5, Paul stated, and I'll read it to make sure I communicate it correctly. He said, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So we'll look that word up, assurance, here, since we have that. And we have the Strong's number G4136, and it's most, that's superlative, most certain confidence. So we have our term defined. And now we see that uh, one person in the article says that nothing outside the realm of mathematical certainty can be uh, achieved uh, absolute certainty outside the realm of mathematics, which is interesting because mathematics, uh, like the creation, points to the creator. The heavens declare his glory. There's astrophysicists today who are Christians, believers. The Bible has been proven to be uh, something that is so assured that it is uh, to a mathematical certainty. Every word in the Bible has a numeric value, every letter. Hebrew, Greek, Hebrew is numeric, pictographic, and phonetic. All this is now available on our computers. Again, this article was in 1997, and I think we can show, I'll just place some things mathematically that we don't have to question. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, the number pi is calculated out. I'll include the link to the PDF that has that math on there, arithmetic. John 1.1 1, 1 has the number e in the value as it's calculated out. You can notice that. There's remarkable um, field uh, out there uh, in now YouTube channels where they go through and each part of the Hebrew letter is made of other letters and they have numeric values and the correlations are, are direct and irrefutable. Uh, the repeating letters, repeating numbers, the patterns in the text, uh, the New Testament as well. <clears throat> so the Bible has already met and is beyond mathematical certainty because it was written over a 1500 year period of time different genre of scripture, of writing, and by 40 different authors. So it just probability alone would not allow for the preservation of that which was originally inspired to be intact today. For example, in the English Bible, the last Bible that was produced by hand, superintended uh, in its inspiration and providentially overseen in the preservation of that inspiration, it's bathed in blood, it's history, all the controversies, politics, religion, the persecutions, uh, all, and the, we have texts that go all the way back to Antioch. So that book is the one that we can look at if, as English readers and notice all these things. So we have the Bible to mathematical certainty, which then points to the mathematician, the true God. The, uh, we speak of God's omniscience omniscience, notice the word science, he is the 
omni scientist. So if what you're doing doesn't point you to that, the field of mathematics points to the mathematician, uh, the omni scientist, as I'm adamantly affirming. We have the Bible, the Bible, and from it we have the science of God, theology. We have that. From that we had this occurred, calculus, physics, chemistry. All of these are products of theologians, calculus, Leibniz and Newton, uh, the ones who disclosed it wrote it down, demonstrated it, physics by a theologian, chemistry by a theologian. From this came pharmacology and technology. So everything we know in the Western world, we have Einstein, Teller, and Oppenheimer, uh, the nuclear technology, uh, the Einstein of E equals MC squared. Uh, they were all Hebrew. Their backgrounds in Hebrew. They were aware of the uh, science in the Hebrew text, the advancement of it, so that what we have today uh, with the, uh, well, nuclear technology, Teller and Oppenheimer, the O, oxygen, H bomb, things like that. So it, it's just, un, it's, it's not even possible to have a serious conversation for, with an atheist, for example. Who would presume to uh, deny this? Richard Feynman, I'll start here. Richard Feynman, who worked on the Manhattan Project and became more known in, later in life for his work on the 1986 space shuttle explosion. Uh, he referred to calculus as the language God speaks. That's the language God speaks. So he noticed that language. He noticed the principles that govern the universe. MIT professor has stated that science discovered God speaking of the uh, forces, the powers, the energies that were antecedent to the material matter of the universe today that's governed according to that. If I can find that link, I'll include it. I'll put the PDFs to these numbers here. Uh, we have the Sir Robert Anderson calculation of 445 B.C., March 14th, when the decree to build, rebuild Jerusalem, we have that to the day of April 6, 32 A.D., the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. We notice that he had pointed out it was exactly 173,880 days, which that was 483 years times the 360-day year. And that leaves that seven-year, 70th week, seven years in the future that is yet to be accomplished. We also had the approximate 6,250 year divine ratio developed by Dr. John Penn uh, at 12 hours per day, per day, and then the 6,250 years at 12 hours night, which gave the 12,500 chronological years times 360 days. If you remember the ratio as Dr. Penn taught us and reminded us one day to a thousand years is a ratio. The inverse relationship of division is multiplication. It's why we're multiplying 360 days. That gives us 4.5 million days. Multiply it by a thousand years. Just change the unit of measure from days to years and add three zeros. We get 4.5 billion years. And as he said, go the opposite direction. Take the 4.5, multiply it by 1,000 days. And 1,000 days is approximately 
2.78 years, and that equaled 12.5 billion years of compounded decay, because remember the number E, E for example, E equals 2.718281828846 something. So you can see these, this is just using integers and whole numbers. We came up with, that is Dr. Penn's uh, formula that he knew was in the scriptures and could be derived by just simply using, as we did here, third grade arithmetic. It demonstrates that this is the same rate at which compound interest, for example, you write E as a limit. It's a limit as N approaches infinity of one plus one over N to the nth power. And this would be the rate of compounding interest so that it's the same rate of compounding decay that Dr. Al Mohler was struggling to find the words for when he was adamantly affirming that the earth looks so old because of the severity of sin. Well, you can calculate the amount of accrued compounded decay in the universe. They had knowledge of that uh, thousands of years ago of millions, I mean billions of years of decay of the earth, accrued compounded decay and 12.5 billion decay, de accrued compounded decay of the universe. So we're really well beyond our questions of mathematical certainty. We, we've, we're in that and beyond it because everything about creation points to the omniscientist. Remember that. We know in Romans it says there were those who would worship the creature more than the creator. Sometimes people have lifted mathematics so high that they don't believe any longer in the mathematician above it, which is because of source avoidance and bias. They want to avoid that. We remember that with the number pi, uh, for example, in our work with a circle and radius, this is radius, that we can take two pi, I mean two radius, which is the diameter all the way through, and we multiply that by pi, that gives us a constant number circumference. Now the interesting thing about that is uh, pi is, for example, we take circumference and divide it by diameter. That's what equals the 3.14159. And it just goes on and it just continues uh, and uh, it's continuously. I, I don't know how far out pi has been worked, maybe to billions of numbers, maybe with our computers day, trillions of numbers. But what it is, is we have um, the number of diameters that it takes to complete this circle is this many. And when you divide it, so you can take the constant radius, double it, two times R constant, but you multiply it by that which isn't a constant, and you come up with a constant which is interesting because uh, those who don't understand the mathological uh, reasoning involved in theological determinism, for example, might advocate pathological versions which would omit, for example, causal agency of man, living God, living soul that he created man, created man a causal being, the hip hill stem. But that's enough. So we've met the, the, the mathematical certainty. We know that it points to the mathematician, the omniscientist, so that when I look at this article, uh, just to point and make something clear, in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, the gospel came in power and in the Holy Ghost, power of God unto salvation, Holy Spirit who inspired it, he's the one who convinces, and then in much assurance, much assurance, most certain confidence. So, just that alone, we could stop our argument and say that just by definition, we've already met and demonstrated that those who would argue that assurance is not certainty are not just contradicting Dr. Bob Wilkins assertion, which is very astute and very accurate, but they're actually contradicting the text itself. So let's move into this and see exactly what they're saying. First of all, we know that in constructs, 
in constructs, we have no certainty. So these who support constructs would get no argument from me. Uh, our, our certainty is in Christ. So let's move on and go to number one. This article shows an R.C. Sproul says that certainty is not an option. Your only option is be uncomfortable with Jesus. Uncomfortable. He said when he had this dreaded thought that he might not be saved, he knew when he went to the Lord about it that he couldn't present his obedience because in comparison to the faithfulness of Christ, nothing compares. All of the humans that have ever lived on the earth to date could add up our faithfulness and it would not come close to the faithfulness of Christ. So uh, he did reason subjectively that, well, it's a good sign that I'm worried about this, his salvation, because he said only true Christians really care about salvation. So apparently he finds certainty in his subjective uh, beliefs. Uh, go on, he says, um, so his is that uncomfortable with Jesus. So he says there's no certainty uh, like the Bible teaches, Dr. Richard Belcher, author of A Layman's Guide to the Lordship Controversy. Uh, he implied that Dr. Wilkin, who called into a radio show, he said, what you're doing is putting assurance in the category of percentages, and I do not like to do that. So Mr. Belcher said it's less than 100%, which is similar to the person that comes in second place is the first loser so the person that says certainty is less than 100% certain, uh, that's then a degree of uncertainty. It's just uh, less uncertainty. But uncertainty to any degree or percentage is uncertainty. So he goes on and uh, Dr. Wilkin correctly concludes that if good works are indispensable for assurance, as Belcher believes, then certainty is impossible. Because that's like uh, adding a known to something that can't be known. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it's irrational to suggest that something that is in the heart of the gospel, the very gospel, this most certain confidence, this assurance is communicated through the gospel. So now we have a Dr. Kenneth Gentry. He said assurance is subjective, rooted in the heart of the believer. Uh, that's not true. It's rooted in the gospel and its fruit is produced in the heart of the believer, just as Persuade, faith comes to the unbeliever through the gospel, that persuasion uh, we receive by faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the narrative of God, the word of God referring to Jesus in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, the person, John 1.1, 1, 1, is logos, the reason and rationale. The rhema is the narrative. Jesus is the content of the gospel. So faith comes to the unbeliever through the gospel. It comes to us so we can believe. Uh, it comes to us in the form of persuasion so that we would believe. We know that persuasion is what secures an audience, for our ear to hear so that we would listen. Persuade means to open in the Old Testament, like Lydia's heart so it was open. That means she had been persuaded. So he says it's subjective root in the heart of believer. That's not true. And he uh, definitely years ago now, I'm sure he's come to realize that error. But as Wilkin concludes, if assurance is subjective, uh, then it's not possible. So now we have three people that are saying there is no certainty and they get no argument from me in the case they built. It's just that uh, certainty is in the heart of the gospel and it is the, the fruit of it is in the heart of the believer. So Walter Chantry, he decried the approach of thinking assurance, linking assurance with God's promises. That is, if I were to tell someone Let's go ahead and write it out. John, John 6, 47, which you all know this one by heart. Amen, amen, lego, lego hemen. So truly, truly, this is Jesus speaking, the omniscientist. Truly, truly, so that's T squared if you like math. 
T squared, truth times truth, truly, truly, I am saying to you all, hope is to own the one who is believing ace into me Eke is already having so ain I own I own me on that's eternal life. There we go. Sorry I wrote so fast, but I want to get this moving. So he's saying that for me, for example, as a, a pastor doing the work of evangelist, for me to go out and tell someone, truly, truly, I, on behalf of Jesus Christ, am saying to you that Jesus said, truly, truly, that everyone who's believing into him is already having everlasting life. And if you believe in Jesus Christ for everlasting life, I can, based on the authority of the scriptures, assure you that you're having it. And then he's saying you can't do that. He went ahead and said that he called something like that a heretical soul-destroying practice, which is interesting, because he made some comments. He said, this is done by people, for example, me, and he accused me of thinking little of God, preaching no law, calling for no repentance, watering down faith to accepting a gift, and maybe I never mentioned bowing to Christ's rule or bearing a cross. Well, interesting that he mentioned repentance because according to uh, Acts 2021 20, repentance toward God that's the Father of Jesus Christ equals faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ so you can read that in English and not miss it you couldn't miss it if you tried where you would notice that there were those in Jesus' day who said they believed Moses, but they wouldn't believe Jesus. And Jesus said, had you believed Moses, then you'd believe in me because uh, Moses spoke of me. But since you don't believe Moses, you won't believe in me. They said, we're of Abraham. He said, well, if you were of Abraham, but you're not, then you would long to see my, you would not be taking stones to kill me because Abraham longed to see my day. This is the same approach that Paul's taking, saying that repentance toward God mind in association with in the direction of God the Father of Jesus is to trust in the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ because the Father at the baptism of his son said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So that voice from heaven itself was quite persuasive in convincing them. So we have repentance if you're teaching people should uh, trust Jesus Christ and turn away from whatever works and law and false gospels and whatever you want to talk about. But it says here, um, that is a call. Telling people to trust Jesus is a call to mind in association with the true and living God, the Father of Jesus Christ. Also, the Bible calls it a free gift. It says free gift in Romans. That's where we get the word free grace in our uh, communication of that. Also, the Bible speaks of obey the gospel. That is, trust Jesus Christ for everlasting life. So to obey Christ, come under his voice. And Jesus said that unbelief is a sin. Sin's a crime. It breaks the law so that it's a crime because the person is able to be persuaded. And yet if they negate persuasion, they will disbelieve rather than believe. And to de deliberately negate persuasion leads the person to de deliberately disbelieve which is to disobey the gospel and not trust Jesus for everlasting life. So how he works around that, he's really missing a lot of points there. But to say that, uh, to tell someone what the Bible says, my systematic theology teacher was, is a, was at the time he was teaching, was an engineer. And he pointed to the Bible and said that you can show people and teach them that their highest uh, assurance and degree of certainty will be found in what's written and not in our volatile feelings so that our gospel, the gospel of John, quite interesting, that Paul said our gospel came in power and in much 
Much comes before the word assurance. Much assurance, and assurance means most certain confidence. Well, here's examples of the things in the gospel that Paul said he preached that brought much most certain confidence because the omniscientist, the one who in Genesis 1-1, remember, we had instantaneity. We were taught that in 1984. In uh, Credenda 2, a publication by the seminary in Little Rock, instantaneity. No time passed in Genesis 1-1. No energy was depleted. The Almighty, Almighty God uh, had power go forth, and yet he didn't lose power. No friction occurred. He's immutable. He doesn't change. So instantly he did all that. Now he says, um, he says this man that was uh, saying we can't have certainty and that it's um, some kind of heretical soul-destroying practice, he said we could know if we believed. He says, so you can answer the first confidently, did, did, I, did I believe? but only the Spirit may answer the last with certainty. But the Bible says, and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God, and yet we have that script that's even a more sure word than our experience, whatever we may, however we may describe that, but we couldn't describe it any better than it was scripted by the Holy Spirit that he bears witness with our spirit. So we go back to the text which is established beyond a degree of assurance that's even beyond mathematical certainty. The book is unsurpassed in its ability to be demonstrated uh, beyond uh, because it was written over a 1,500-year period of time, 40 different authors, uh, perhaps almost seven or more genres of literature in, within it. So uh, that really is nothing else that needs to be said. So this is the man that spoke of uh, mathematical certainty, legal certainty, moral certainty, and now the insisting that because mathematical certainty is the highest level of certainty, the error he's made, which is what I'm calling, this is now entering into what's called atheism, is you're placing mathematics at the level of the mathematician, the omniscientist, and saying that even the Bible, which meets and far beyond the fulfilled prophecies, the mathematics within it, the fact that theology came from the Bible, branches of science came from theology, pharmacology, technology, which this means that... Uh, Science is theological and evolution isn't scientific. Isn't that, isn't that striking how clear that becomes when you actually care to evaluate? But now those who have negated persuasion practice source avoidance, but yet there are Christian physicists, creation physicists, astrophysicists who are Christians. Uh, so there's nothing about it that would reduce the veracity and reality of science. Even the uh, Richard Dawkins, one of the most... Uh, I guess, a leading atheist today, a neo-atheist, I guess, he admitted that these chemistry, physics, and calculus derive from theology. So I'm not sure how to make a better case. It's just if we don't now move beyond, it's like atheism and this advocate saying, well, you can't know, uh, you can't have assurance with a degree of certainty known only in mathematics. Well, that's not true. We have the mathematics, as Jesus said, the scriptures point to me and those of you who are searching the scriptures thinking in them you have life are refusing to come to me. Those who would look at mathematics and say, well, we've reached the top. No, the math points to him just as the creation points to him, just as the heavens declare his glory point to him, just as we now know that to say that we didn't come to this level of mathematical certainty, first, that's just someone who's either completely ignorant of the scriptures or this article back in 1997 was involving input by people who didn't notice, but they seem to be scholastic people. But he says Jesus promises eternal life to all who believe in him. If someone is not sure he has eternal life, he plainly doesn't believe Jesus' promise. Assurance does exclude doubt. So I've got three up here, and there's more. There's almost, I think there's six who refute through argumentation 
that it's possible to be certain. Now he says and concludes, Dr. Wilkin does, in spite of what many theologians and pastors are saying today, you can be sure certainty is found in taking God at his word. Now you see what he's done? He's gone back up here to the omniscientist. He's pointing out that assurance is in the heart of the gospel and that assurance is conveyed and the fruit of this assurance that is at the heart of the gospel is found in uh, conveys to the heart of the believer. So he says, uh, Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. If you believe him, then you know you have everlasting life. It's simple as that. It's actually so certain uh, that apparently it's disturbing uh, so into it, the, what I mean by atheism is I'll show you here if there's no certainty in constructs and those who support the constructs say there's no certainty their error is they're saying that you don't have it from the scriptures from the omni scientist who's actually speaking and yet we have a famous physicist says calculus is the language God speaks we have a famous atheist Richard Dawkins saying yes these fields of science came from theology, from where we now have pharmacology and technology. We also have the Hebrew language. We have, as I referenced earlier, Einstein and Teller and Oppenheimer. I'm not really sure how a person that's religious and supports the construct, let's just say whatever this is, let's say it's uh, you got Calvin, Luther, Armenian, uh, Molina, Pelagius, whatever those things are, and there's disputes there. Someone said that Calvinism was very concrete or something. I said, well, there's 4.3.2 point more. There's high, low, moderate, hyper. So they really weren't being uh, honest in communicating, and it has formed categories. Uh, it's fallible, self-contradicting, uh, Support Calvinism, but in doing so, you must accept, as um, Kenneth Gentry said, he said that you cannot, cannot know if you are elect. Now, his threshold, which is atheism, and I'll show you why, he said, unless your name, he said, there's no text that has the name Ken Gentry as elect. So you see what he says? He's saying he's created a threshold just as atheists do. I don't care how much evidence you have. I don't care what the Bible, how accurate it is, how precise it is, how mathological it is. I don't care about Genesis 1-1 where pi is calculated in it, John 1-1 where E is there. I don't care about the compound decay rate accrued just as Euler's number E. I don't care that they knew uh, the difference between chronological age, geological ages. I don't care that in Psalm 90, 100% of, uh, 90% of, uh, of lifespan was removed from 100% of humanity. Uh, I don't want to hear about a continuing uh, uh, infinite decimal here repeating 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 this number that makes it variable rather than constant that it can be used to multiply the diameter to get the constant number circumference uh, I don't want to know about the specific uh, information given by Jesus the one of whom the fullness of the Godhead I'm saying that we're advocating and supporting a version, a doctrine, a view, a definition, a term called elect that cannot be known. So therefore, if that cannot be known, then you can't know this. Well, now they're taking their own reasoning and placing it over, supplanting what Jesus said. And then one person said, well, you might know that you believe, but you can't know that you have everlasting life. Well, the truth is, uh, none of that's true. All that's a negation of the truth. It says in spite of the accuracy of the Bible, the math, uh, the assurance we have in it to the degree of mathematical certainty, it points back, but Bob Wilkin correctly says, take God at his word. How would we call Jesus into question when it's so specific? And when this here is admitted, now I, I've always believed election was arbitrary where people would speak and say, well, I believe 
uh, I'm elect or I believe you have to be elect to go to heaven. And then what they did was they supplanted the rationale for election. Ra elect, the word elect means reasoned out. In Jesus' lifetime, he called his students unto him and he reasoned away 12, reasoned away from those students 12. So he reasoned out from the called out. The called out were the ones who responded when called and heard the call and came out severed their ties, disconnected, made an entrance into that ecclesia that was called out who walked with Christ. And here we have all this information. So really what you're dealing with, this is what happens when your Calvinism, the construct I'm particularly referencing here because of this emphasis on elect and then the, the conclusion that it cannot be known. Not that it's an unknown. It cannot, you cannot know. And his uh, standard of, of evidential criteria is that your name would have to be written in there. So when we tell someone, if you trust the Jesus, you have an everlasting life, we haven't had to change any definitions. We haven't had to do anything except by using the Gospel of John, which was written by inspiration, superintended by Holy Spirit, so that a person could, that is, faith would come, they could believe, and it'd come in the form of persuasion so that they would believe. So Persuasion comes, faith uh, uh, follows, and the person believes. So we don't have anything taking place except this, this, this which is very consistent with the living God, living theism, the Father who sends the prophets, who preached the gospel of the coming Messiah, the Son who sent the apostles, who preached the Messiah who came and who was crucified, and he was the suffering one. We saw Paul talking to Agrippa, and Agrippa said in such a short synopsis, Paul, you're already persuading me to come to be a Christian. So we're seeing how powerful the gospel is, how efficacious it is, and we're seeing that Dr. Bob Wilkin points to the God of the Bible, the Christ of the gospel, the Holy Spirit who inspired it, the power of God unto salvation. And when you go and look up the word in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, for example, you find that assurance, most certain confidence uh, is at the very heart of the gospel. So uh, we've met the test. We've met all the criteria. What, I, what I'm suggesting and what I know from my experience in talking with people who uh, prefer to identify themselves as atheists, they don't meet any evidential criteria. They just simply negate. They just say, no matter what you say, it's never enough. And that's what these men are saying that, as R.C. Sproul said, the best you can do is hope to just take the option of uncomfortable with Jesus. Uh, others said, well, you can, you're, whatever you say, you can't have a degree of certainty. And then they throw in that uh, mathematical certainty as if that's the highest. Well, you remember in Romans 125, they placed the creature at the level of the creator, even beyond worshiping the creature more than the creator. So to say that mathematics and the certainty therein is the highest is one step below the truth because the mathematician, the omniscientist, uh, the true and living God, the one being three persons, the Godhead of the scriptures that the Bible says man is without an excuse because the invisible things of God, his eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen, and Jesus is that creator, the one through whom, by whom, and apart from whom nothing was created. So everything came to be through him, and nothing came to be without him. So, yes, I said it, and I said it because I think sometimes bias to support constructs, and as a professional interrogator and worked on investigations for years, uh, this seems like the language that these gentlemen have presented was deliberate and guarded, and it was uh, influenced by the uh, form of the construct. So when you're trying to save your construct, you might have to contradict the text, which is nothing we need to do. We can tell people of a certainty. We can say, just as Jesus, we can say, look what Jesus said. He said, truly, truly, I'm saying to you all, the one who's believing into me is already having everlasting life. Do you trust Jesus Christ for everlasting life? So you have a blessed day. Enjoy this lesson. And I hope I can get out of the way and let you see the board. But I don't know how much more math. It's third grade arithmetic. Uh, the calculations and other things. I'll have that on the board in the links for you. 
and put that into description. So have a blessed day. Enjoy this. But this is more atheism than whatever I thought Calvinism was so many years ago. And this really opened my eyes to how to support something you something as subjective as this, but you say it because you want to protect your definition of elect, which doesn't exist in the scriptures. There's not a text that says elect under regeneration. I, I guess this is just kind of gone so far that people are following it now. But these are things that are strange because to say you cannot know, but then to continue to assert something as essential to a person becoming a child of God, it's really striking. So have a blessed day. Enjoy this lesson.